All right, it is that time of the year again, 2022's 20 best albums of the year. Yes, we are going to do 20 of them this year. And of course, I want to see arguments down in the comments. After all, what is YouTube for, if not just a forum, for us to yell at each other about our shit opinions? All right, number 20, Smino's Love for Rent vibes all the way throughout this record. Really, really enjoyable. I did a reaction up on the Patreon, by the way, if you wanted to see that one. And while it didn't quite have the substance of some of the other records that we'll talk about later in this list, I can't help but enjoy almost everything that Smino's put out that I've listened to anyway. Top project. 19, then lower than I was expecting, actually, when I first listened to this. Loyal Karner's Hugo. Here, one of the best lyricists and most thoughtful guys coming out of the UK. Really just cements his confidence, I think, on this third record, which mainly goes into the relationship with his father. It's a really complete sounding project, but it also showcases Loyal, like I said, really stepping up in terms of his confidence on the microphone. Always had the ability, always had the skill set, but not falling back so much on the same ad-libs that he used to. And really just speaking from the heart with uh, strong lyricism throughout. Really enjoyed this project. It's particularly pertinent to me, given it's about his relationship with his father. Highly recommended if you're not really too keen on some of the music coming out of the UK. Okay. That's some of the drill stuff, the pop drill stuff, which I'm really not too keen on either. Um, just something more introspective and lyrical to check out. So I highly recommend it. At number 18 then, and it's Britain's challenging, weird, but ultimately fantastic Black Midi with Hellfire. Such a musically accomplished record that it's almost mind-blowing. You see this drummer, Morgan Sampson, they, they call him like one of the best drummers in the world. There's no doubt about that. And actually, how I tuned into Black Midi was when uh, somebody in one of my comments said, focus on the drummer. Black Midi is about the drummer, less so than everything else that's going on. He's what drives the band. He's effectively the singer, which is not really fair to the singer, Geordie Greep, who is um, a very unusual chap that sings in a very unusual way about unusual things. But Black Midi Hellfire in many ways is the most musically sort of outstanding record of the year, or certainly up there. But it's not something you can really bang on at a party. Well, not something you'd necessarily put on while you're driving or to chill out to. It's something to, to put on and focus on and be challenged by. But has many tuneful moments, has many head nodding moments and some real, real striking sounds in there. I love Black Midi. I can't wait for what they do next. They're very prolific as well. And it's such a thrilling scene happening here in the UK at the moment with all these bands, a lot of which are intertwined and know each other, pushing each other for greatness. It's thrilling. It's thrilling to be part of a scene as well. And part of a scene where I can see a lot of these bands for fucking no money in small venues. That hasn't happened for a long time. Great stuff. Number 17, going a little bit underground with Rock Marciano and the Alchemist in the Elephant Man's Bones. Dense, complex, beautifully produced, of course, by the Alchemist. Harrowing, haunting at times. Fire lyricism from Rock Marciano, an artist that I've not spent enough time exploring his back catalogue. Again, I don't know how much emotional weight I connected to this album. I was more just sort of standing there impressed, standing there impressed by the bars, always blown away by the Alchemist production. And I think really important to be exploring some of the underground records that are coming out this year. I mean, is this underground? I guess you can probably go further underground than this, but I think you all know what I mean. I mean, some people will call this artist underground. I don't know if that's necessarily the case. It certainly isn't the case sonically. It's uh, my number 16 is Saba with Few Good Things. This came out much earlier in the year and it really is such an accomplished record. I was wondering what Saba would do, where he would go after the fantastic care for me. Um, this is a little lighter, I would say, than that project. I don't know if it has a moment quite as powerful as uh, Prom King, for example, but um, nevertheless, it sort of builds track by track, brilliant production, again, gorgeous bass lines, like in the previous album. And Saba just showcasing that he's just a really, really strong artist. And it's just one of those albums that you can put on front to back and really get something out of every single time. There's depth here, there's substance here, there's good lyricism here. It doesn't have that quite knock you on your ass uh, track, like I said, but I don't think you could ask for a, a more accomplished project to, to come from Saba for his third effort. Definitely an artist to be keeping tabs on. Definitely an artist to be keeping track of. Will he make it to the very top? I don't think an artist like that can make it to the top these days, but thankfully hip hop is broad enough and big enough and the fan base is big enough these days that an artist like Saba can produce projects like this, get the critical acclaim and hopefully still be able to tour and, and make money that way. I don't know, the music industry is a strange place at the moment. You want an artist like this to be uh, kind of bigger than he is, but I hope that he's in a, a great place because it's a top project. Now, number 15, an artist, we don't need to worry about their financial situation. It's Beyonce with Renaissance. I thought this was a shoe in for top 10 when I first listened to it. That first reaction was uh, one of my most enjoyable to film on the day, just because it was just pure vibes, pure energy. I recorded it actually 
at the midnight release. It released over here in midnight in UK time. And it was the perfect time to listen to it. And honestly, I thought I'd be going back to it a lot more than I actually have. I still think that it's a tremendously accomplished kind of like shift in direction to go into this sort of house dance music direction there's a lot of artists and moments and sounds and samples that are very important and sort of fundamental to the lgbt like musical community over the years you're still able to kind of showcase her vocal ability her range all while maintaining the vibe but i'm surprised that i spun it less than i thought i would especially during the sunnier months of the year and going back and listening to it now it's still super strong but again this is something that i'm going to talk about a lot on this top 20 list emotionally didn't massively um last with me didn't 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 leave a huge impact didn't leave a huge crater in my soul like some of these records did so top stuff super listenable will probably be listenable for years and years and years as a timeless sound to it because i mean some of the sounds are here from 70s 80s 90s and beyond but yeah actually surprised me i, I thought that was a shoe in for top 10 but here we are 14 it's drake and 21 savage with her loss it's a, just a, a record full of absolute bangers thoroughly enjoyable from front to back as a kind of follow on from Jimmy's Cooks, uh, showcasing once again at 21 Savage is the feature killer and showing that Drake is one of the most consistent artists ever. Is he going to match his like true pinnacles in the Take Cares, in the Nothing Was The Same, and the, if you're reading this, I don't know if that's possible. I don't know if he still has that capacity to do that. But every single time he puts out a project, it delivers many, many good tracks. And plenty of people will disagree with me on that one. But I don't care. It's still got one of the strongest pens ever, despite the ghostwriting accusations and sort of truths that came out in the past. Still capable of capturing the kind of human essence in an Instagram caption line that so few people are able to do and other people will try, but they just can't manage it. And once again, he manages to bring you on for a journey that you're not on. He posted an Instagram uh, picture the other day talking about how he was there with his boys in Turks and Caicos and all these broke people aren't. And it made you feel like you were with him. But actually, we're the broke people who aren't with him. All of us, apart from like the nine people who were with him. It's a magic trick. He's the master of it. 13 is Rosalia. Uh, Moto Mami, um, a fantastic start to the year with this one. Just like brave, fearless, varied, sometimes an absolute sort of head a head pounder sometimes like confoundingly operatic you never know what's coming next on this project i must admit despite the amazing impact that it had on me on first listen and future listens it hasn't really sat with me throughout the year in a way that i kind of expected it to a lot of people compare it to yeezus and i don't massively want to talk about kanye west on this video but it definitely has a similar quality in that it's sort of shocking and full of verve and you don't know where it's going next and it's challenging and abrasive at times but I think Yeezus ultimately has significantly uh, more to it, more substance, more to go back to. Whereas uh, Moto Mami, in shocking, it's almost like a movie with too many twists that the first time you watch it, it blows you away. But when you go back to it and you kind of know when the twists are coming, they don't hit in the same way. I kind of feel like that with Moto Mami. It's still a fantastic project. If you're making it into this year's top 20, you're a fantastic project. So I just want to make that clear. But I'm just being hypercritical. This is why some of these albums didn't make the top 10. And going back and listening to Moto Mami, some of those tracks, some of those tracks, a little bit skippy for me. Not like an old CD player from the 90s, just a little bit skippy for me. Number 12 then, and it's Freddie Gibbs with Soul Sold Separately. A surprise that this didn't make it into the top 10. When I was compiling this list, there was a bunch of albums that I just thought were shoo-in for like number six, number seven. But then I kept writing the things down and I was like, I don't think this one's going to make it. And it didn't make it. There's nothing really negative to say about the album. It's a fucking great record. I just think that perhaps I prefer... And I think because we've been given so many of these projects, I prefer when Freddie's in the lab with one producer. The two Mad Lib projects, obviously absolutely outstanding in Bandana and Piñata. We have Alfredo with Alchemist. We even have the one with Kenny Beats and also the other one with Currency and Alchemist in Fetty. Here he's sort of brought in a who's who of producers and track after track after track after track, absolutely slap. But I think Freddie working with that consistent theme just did it more for me. But I think that's purely just because those albums are so good and this isn't quite as good as those. They're a bunch of nines and perhaps this is an eight. You've still got that machine gun flow, the energy, the humor, the wit, the grit, the griminess and the sleaziness of a lot of the bars, the cocaine humor, the real fucking gangster bars. Some of the heartbreak and heartfelt stuff on there really hits as well. I'm almost convincing myself it should be a top 10 record sat here now thinking about it but 
I'm stuck with my top. I, I mean, I stressed about those top 10 guys. I can't lie. Listen, get your albums of the year down in the comments as I slump down here. Yeah, we'll argue with each other, but also so many people are going to watch this and we'll be looking at the comments and make sure, you know, there's stuff that I haven't listened to this year that I'll check from the comments. And there would be stuff that uh, so many people out there that haven't heard that they may find their new favourite album uh, from these comments. So make sure you're getting them in. It's also separately just doesn't quite make my top 10. But it was close. And you know what's crazy? My number 11. And the only reason this isn't in the top 10, uh, guys, is time. It's just time. And it's Lil Sims with No Thank You, an absolute masterclass of rapping skill from, um, in my opinion, the UK's best rapper. I'm not talking female rapper. The UK's best rapper. We're not including MF Doom in that conversation, by the way. We're talking rappers who sort of identify as being from the UK with a UK sound with a UK accent, right? Just so accomplished, so confident, so skillful, so masterfully produced, much more stripped back than um, and less grandiose than her previous album, the Mercury Award winning uh, Simbi, So I Might Be Introvert, which came out last year. Like I said, this isn't quite as sort of orchestral and operatic and, and, and grand as that album. It's more just like track after track after track of her speaking about an issue with her management label. Um, but all of the, all of the tracks can be taken as broader than her just talking about that as well. They're, they're kind of narrow focus, but broad in focus, but they're just a showcase of her as an elite tier rapper globally, elite tier rapper. And I spoke on my video on my reaction to this album about form. I think the days of us listing who are the best rappers in the world are certainly a top five. It's almost impossible now because you're talking about legacy artists who can't be touched like Jay-Z who's obviously still active, but not massively. You're talking about people who've been absolutely dominant for the last decade in Drake, Cole, Kendrick and others. You've got people who were brilliant and have dropped off a little bit, perhaps like Eminem, but does that discredit his older work? You've got people who come back into form like Nas. And then you've got people who are right there, right now, last two projects, last three, certainly, in Sims, who's right there with the best of the best right now. Does that mean she's the greatest of all time? No, because I just think that argument is there's too many people and it's too difficult to do it. So while the argument's still fun, I want to think about form. And I don't think there's many rappers out there in the world who are on better form right now than Little Sims. This is a top 10 record of the year that didn't make it into the top 10 purely because I've only listened to it front to back twice and then a bunch of songs uh, a couple more times more than that. And that's just the reality of the situation. It came out super late in the year, but I'm still happy to get it up on here on this video. Into the top 10 then. Into the top 10 then. And make sure you subscribe if you haven't. It's going to be a big 2023. We're going to get some shifts in content style on the channel. Of course, the album reactions are still going to be the centerpiece. But uh, look forward to a bunch of different style of videos coming next year. I want to be talking to more people. I want to be getting out of this fucking house a bit more as well. Speaking to people, interviews and broadening what we're doing over here. And perhaps even not just talking about music. So make sure you're subscribed if you're not yet. Because we're going to be going on a journey and subscribe to the other channels if you haven't john denton too etc anyway into the top 10 number 10 danger mouse and black thought with cheat codes every single time i listen to this album or songs from this album i quite often just pick and choose tracks from this album you know i pick out a strangers with asap rocky and run the jewels i pick out a belize uh, with doom i pick out an aquamarine uh, with michael kimonuka it's just fantastic i love the production on this album i love the like almost like double bass bass guitar heavy production all of the beats are fantastic black thought is one of the greatest rappers mcs lyricists that you could ever possibly wish to hear to the point where he's one of those people when you listen to him you're kind of like how is anybody this good i mean we're talking about the top five thing just before earlier in the video can anybody really be better than him but then again, who would I rather listen to sort of day to day to day? Am I always going to listen to Black Thought, go back and listen to The Roots? Not necessarily. So that's why I'm talking about form. But Black Thought, both on form and all time on this album. Production from a master in Danger Mouse who I've been enjoying listening to since the Grey album all those years ago. Again, talking about form, back on form here. Just a fantastic listen from front to back had to make it into the top 10. And it's one of those albums that you could throw to uh, somebody who doesn't necessarily love hip hop, especially modern rap and hip hop. And I think they would appreciate the production and the quality of what they can, what they can get 
out of the lyricism and the rapping to someone whose ear isn't tuned into that. Like mine used to be less, if that makes sense. And they get loads out of this as well. Just fucking great. And I think it's going to be one that we go back to loads and loads and loads. And people, it's going to be one of those albums that people forget about. People forget exists. I almost forgot about it for this top 10. Remember, and I was like, got to get it in there. So yeah, Cheat Codes from Danger Mouse and Black Thought. If you've not listened to it and you're a hip hop fan, you're missing out. Get it on straight away. And there's loads of rappers that you know on there. Joey Badass is on there. Russ is on there. ASAP Rocky is on there. Conway's on there. It's fantastic. It really is. Number nine, it's Drake with Honestly Nevermind. Yeah, I said it. I don't care. I don't care. Listen, music is subjective anyway. But also a top 10, a top 20 list like this, which is not a top 10 list, should be about your personal experiences. And in, an, in a horrendous summer for me, I had a really difficult summer mentally, physically. This album, maybe this was the reason. <laughs> Sorry, but no. This album was like a, a, a real comfort for me during some of the nicer periods that we managed to have during the summer weather. And while it gets off to a bit of a rough start, I think by the sort of um, a, thir a third of the way in and then towards the back end of the album, it genuinely is fantastic. Seeing an artist in Drake take a, a leap like this into a different genre, um, I thought was really cool. And I said on the, um, on the album reaction at the time, I have grown up with this type of music. This type of music is completely embedded in, in British culture, in UK culture, sonically. Uh, dance music, house music, I'm not saying it comes from here originally, but it's completely embedded in the culture to the point where it's actually more normal to hear music in this genre on mainstream radio than it would be to hear rap and hip hop. So it didn't, uh, once I kind of realized what was going on with the project, it didn't really surprise me. And I kind of knew with Drake's prolificness that we we're going to get another rap record at some point. And after the amount of rap that he's put out over the years, why not take a little detour in a different direction? Now, I can understand people going, fine, but I think it's a shit one of those records. And I go, I just don't. I just don't think it's a shit one of those records. I think tracks like Massive. I think tracks like Flight's Booked. I think tracks like Overdrive, um, as well as Jimmy Cooks, who's obviously a different thing, but a cracker to, to end the album. I think they're all standouts, man. I really do. And do you know what's interesting? I've been streaming a little bit recently and just playing some tunes. And I didn't have the, the song titles up on screen when I did it. And I think I put on uh, Massive, followed by Flight's Booked. And we had loads of people in the comments going, oh, what's this? This is good. And I was like, it's fucking Drake from Honestly Nevermind. You know the album that everybody told you was absolute shit that you probably didn't actually get around to listening to? Or maybe you got a couple of tracks in and didn't listen to? Yeah, it's from that. And yeah, it sounds fucking good, right? Like some of the other music in this genre that's been coming out this year and sounding really good too. Talking of music in this genre, in the broader genre, this isn't an album, but one of the best things musically, I had to shout it out on here. One of the best things musically that I've seen or experienced this year, Fred Again's Boiler Room set unbelievable an hour long that thing has now 11 million views and i really do think that is an important moment in what's going to be the future uh, uh sort of dance and house music obviously it's always been very very popular and uh, particularly you know it's, it's definitely experiencing a renaissance no pun intended but that having 11 million views means that it's reached pe you know far beyond the scene it's definitely reached far beyond the scene and it is i'm not you know i like the music forever but i'm definitely not part of the scene at my age anymore but that um, has made me want to investigate all of his music, um, everything that he's doing. And that's something that we'll look to do at the beginning of this year. If you haven't seen it, what he is able to do in like a DJ and dance music setting, playing a lot of his own music and other people's music and the crowd interaction and the energy is absolutely incredible. Like I said, it's not an album, despite the fact that it's a lot of his own music, but I needed to give it a shout out here. One of the best musical experiences that I've had this year. And like I said, in a tough year, that Boiler Room set has uh, brought me joy on multiple occasions. And so is this Honestly Nevermind record. So fuck the haters. I'm talking my shit. This is what I think. That's it. All right, number eight is Nas uh, with King's Disease 3. Is it quite as good as King's Disease 2? I'm not sure. Is it as good or consistent? It's much longer. Is it as consistent as Magic, which came out sort of Christmas time last year? Maybe not. Is it once again, inarguably one of the absolute greatest to ever do it? Once again, finding impossible form as he nears his 50th year, working with an incredible collaborator in Hit Boy just to create tune after tune after tune, moment after moment after moment, substance upon substance upon substance with a track beef, almost like a long follow up from uh, I Gave You Power, where he rapped from the perspective of a gun. Here, we're rapping from the perspective, the concept, the metaphysical concept of beef between people. An incredible track to cement uh, uh, another amazing outing and an incredible trilogy, which had an extra bonus album thrown in there as well from Nas. I love to see an elder statesman 
still maintain that energy and not trying to sound like the kids. You know what I mean? Not trying to be Steve Buscemi with a backwards cap and a skateboard, he says, with a cap on. Just speaking with an energy and a verve, but as an elder statement, giving game back to the younger people, having everybody listen. And then he goes and puts out that track with 21 Savage after 21 Savage said that Nas wasn't relevant. Instead of creating beef, instead of creating drama, instead of doing something that would have blown up probably bigger than this song did online because we all, we're all all addicted to drama, it's human nature. Nas instead took that elder statesman role and produced a great track with 21 Savage and further showcasing 21 Savage's ability and hopefully giving 21 Savage a bit of perspective. Nas, master master number seven metro boomins heroes and villains talking to 21 savage absolutely destroys it on this project and this is like a return to form for this kind of spacey trap sound futures album i never liked you didn't quite make it into my top 20 but it was another example of this kind of sound which is dwindling i wouldn't say it's dying but it's dwindling and then drake and 21 savage did it as well but i think this album honestly metro boomins record kind of upstage Drake and uh, 21 Savages album just coming out a couple of weeks later and it really is just an absolute tour de force of this sound that reminded me of the first time I listened to Rodeo like Travis Scott talking to form again Travis Scott on rare form on this project 21 on rare form on this project Don Tolliver on rare form on this project and then you had that amazing moment where The Weeknd comes on doing the cover of the Mario Winans classic I don't want to know the track creep in beautiful moment love the reaction on that I think I've separated that reaction out on TikTok talking has done mad on there as well so love it and just after the sort of year year plus that metro boomin has had in personal uh, point of view with everything that happened with his mother to then go and put a project out of this caliber is amazing to see that there's more in the works from him coming out very soon as well and also not just with his mum like with his you know friends and collaborators in thug and gunner but showing once again i've been saying this for ages i think i've said it on every single metro boomin thing i've ever put out that he's one of the greatest electronic musicians in the world he could be scoring movies as well easily and i'm sure that will happen soon a shout out to, to terence and terrell who are always saying that who are always talking about that on their videos and yeah just exactly what you wanted it to be and exceeded all expectations of what it could be i think a spacey trap classic narrowly missing out then on the top five is denzel curry with melt my eyes see your future i feel bad not getting this in the top five but it is what it is this is where we are just a fantastic showcase of denzel curry as a rapper showing that him going back to to truly writing and crafting songs allows him to take his art to a higher level than the entirely freestyle but very enjoyable zoo which came out um, a little while ago and here i just love the fact that we move from kind of pure beats, bars and breaks, hip hop in some of the tracks on here through to some crazy like slow ties screaming over drum and bass choruses in Zatuichi. X-Wing was almost like a vibey kind of trap number with like a piano hook on there. Denzel Curry for me will always remain underrated. And I hate that. Some people say that to me, you're underrated. And that kind of, there's part of you that thinks that that just means that you're never going to be massive. But Denzel Curry is massive. He sold out shows in London. He sells out tours. He sells out shows. His music does numbers. He does great collaborations with great people. He has the respect of everybody. And in Melt My Eyes, See Your Future, he put out his best project to date. Um, we're losing a little bit of that screaming, angsty, uh, almost crossing over into metal style Denzel Curry. But I feel that he has that in his locker to bring that back at any point. But I also feel that it's important that he doesn't sort of pigeonhole himself into that style. It's like, oh, it's Denzel Curry, the guy that makes sumo, the guy that makes black metal terrorists. Well, yeah, but also... It's the guy that makes walking a sort of plowing, plodding epic that is pure, almost old school rap. Yet, he doesn't want to fit into that box either. A, a supremely brilliant artist that we're lucky to have and with incredible energy. You ever seen him live? Oh my goodness, the guy moves like a super athlete. It's incredible. It's incredible the energy that he has. So hopefully we'll get more from Denzel Curry in the future. Brilliant guy, brilliant artist. And yeah, thrilling, thrilling record. Okay, number five. And it's only at number five. Kendrick Lamar, Mr. Morale, and The Big Steppers. I don't think it's Kendrick's best project. I really appreciated everything that he spoke about on this project. I, I really appreciated the kind of delve into his own psyche, 
uh, his delve into his experience with therapy on this album and how therapeutic some of the songs sounded as well. Father Time, an absolutely incredible record. Mother I Sober, uh, a sort of groundbreaking and mind-blowing track. Having Beth Gibbons from Portishead on the album as well. There's no doubting, there's no questioning Kendrick Lamar as an absolute master of the craft, an absolute all-time artist, an absolute genius. But I don't think this had quite, you know, I don't think this record could ever possibly have the cultural impact of To Pimp a Butterfly. And for me, sonically, it wasn't quite as enjoyable as Damn, but that doesn't mean that it's not an amazing project and the top five record of the year, because it absolutely is. I guess my only issues with the project, and it seems crazy to even bring up issues into a top five record, but we hold Kendrick to the highest possible standard. It is that certain tracks, like some of the collabs with Kodak Black, certain tracks just don't seem to have the longevity of like uh, how much a dollar cost, and which is a bit of an unfair comparison. But I'm thinking like a Die Hard, tracks that I like, like a Die Hard or um, Silent Hill, that feel like enjoyable moments, even an N95, a track that I really, really admire. As we move into him collaborating more with his cousin and slightly avant-garde sounds in that respect, I don't know if we're going to get so many of those absolute profound era defining Kendrick tracks anymore. There are some on this album, I've mentioned them already. Are we even gonna get another project from Kendrick Lamar? I don't know, but by all accounts, the live show is incredible. Unfortunately, I missed it when it came here. And of course, there will be plenty of people that have this as the number one record of the year. I still hold him up as the most incredible artist, a mind blowing, um, joy to be alive at the same time as him type of artist. But I preferred other albums this year and that's just the way it is. And one of them was my number four album for the year. Um, it's The Weekend with Dawn FM. Came out super early this year, but I spent all year with it. Um, I think the first half of this album is an absolute tour de force. I absolutely love how it dives back into a sound that I remember hearing in my house when I was super, super young. A kind of British 80s synth sound. He even adopts a British accent, an English accent on, on Gasoline. We have that amazing moment where How Do I Make You Love Me moves into Take My Breath, which gave that song new life after having been put out as a single before beforehand and being good but not really uh, blowing us away in a way that perhaps we would expect sacrifice has just gone from strength to strength to strength and then you have a second half of the record which has a couple of features which I don't know if they really do the album justice from Tyler and Little Wayne I don't think they do a great deal for the album and in fact when he went to go and do his Dawn FM experience with Amazon those tracks were taken out and I don't know if that's just because he didn't want to have them in there given he didn't have the collaborators in the room in the studio in the in the environment it almost feels like there's um there's a different Dawn on FM that, that actually takes out some of these tracks. And of course, we've got Every Angel is Terrifying, which starts out sounding like an absolute fucking worldy of a track, but then kind of turns into a weird gimmick. Yeah, we still finish up with Less Than Zero, um, which is just a gorgeous track. We have Out of Time, which was a fantastic moment as well for the year. I think if it had kept up the energy of the first half, I think it would have ended up as my record of the year. Well, maybe. There's a couple of big hitters still to go. But as the rain starts to fall, and you might be able to hear it now, I just live with Dawn FM as... A fantastic weekend record, but not my favourite weekend record, and perhaps not quite as strong as After Hours. I'm, I'm pretty confident in saying that, but still, the fact that this far into his career, this far established now as a pop artist, as opposed to this like underground mysterious sensation from before, and a man much happier, an artist much happier in himself and healthier, the fact he's still able to produce music of this calibre and quality is just... It's just a treat, really. It's an absolute treat. And I really hope that we get another album before long because it's just wonderful to experience that with all you guys as well who support me and follow the channel. Number three, then, it's J.I.D. with The Forever Story. This guy is an absolute diamond. And he delivered a masterclass in rap skill, in track variety, in album sequencing, in substance, in emotion in outrageous abilities, so much so that sometimes you just sit back and just go, how is this even possible? He's almost so good that you don't appreciate what you're hearing at the time. But I think people are appreciating it now because the amount of shouts that I've had from you guys on my Twitter saying that this is your album of the year goes to show that he really has broken through to another level. Will we get a guy that sounds like J.I.D. break through to the toppest, toppest, toppest level and be the number one? I don't know if that's possible anymore with the way music is going. Yeah, I'm buzzing that he's got so many streams this year 
largely in part to that feature with Imagine Dragons. But hey, this is how you break through. You make a play like that. You do a track with that with an incredibly popular mainstream brand and you showcase your best ability on there which is exactly what he did my kid absolutely loves that song and knows jid more than he probably doesn't even know who kendrick is certainly doesn't know who denzel curry is he's 11 years old but he knows who jid is because of that track and i talked about that before and actually jid re retweeted a video of me talking about that which my kid was buzzing from so yeah and that gets him some extra points too but you've got tracks like brother them sister them you've got the amazing singing on cody blue 31 you've got surround sound and dance now which came out before both of which still sound fantastic You've got that gorgeous track, Can't Make You Change, with Ari Lennox. And I'm so happy that he actually managed to get 2007, get the sample cleared. So that is the proper ending to the record. So it is the sort of double infinity sign, the forever story as intended. I listened to that separately as part of my album reaction, but now it's there as it should be. I'm really, really happy for J.I.D. He deserves everything that he gets, his skill level, his feature ability. He is the, the shining jewel, the shining star of the Dreamville label. Is he as good as Cole? In many ways, he's better. I think skill for skill, he could outwrap Cole, but he just hasn't quite had those moments, that absolute cultural moment yet. And I think rap might be in such a different place than it was when Cole was having those moments that he might not be able to, nearly a decade on from like Forest Hills Drive, for example. But if he keeps going in this way, speaks he speaks in the way that he does, raps in the way he does, puts music out of this caliber, then he will have a very, very long and prosperous career in this game. And the Forever Story will be an album that we go back to over and over and over again, because it will stand the test of time. Skills of this this calibre, stand the test of time. All right then, number two, Pusha T. It's almost dry. My number one rap record of the year. Well, no spoilers for what number one is there, I guess, maybe. I just think this album is absolutely fantastic. Like I said, I didn't want to talk about Kanye on this um, top 20 albums video, but you got to because you produced half this album and it was Kanye on incredible form in the booth. Thankfully, not allowed anywhere near a microphone. Dreaming of the Past with the Kanye production, an unbelievable track, but it's actually the Pharrell parts of the album that I keep really, really going back to. I listen to this thing front to back almost every single week since it came out. Earlier on in the year, I had Kendrick ahead of this. I had J.I.D. ahead of this, but I trust my own gut and I trust my own choice when it comes to what I'm putting on over and over and over and over again. And the truth of the matter is, I fucking love this record. I love the cocaine luxury of it. I love the incredible production. I love Pusha T's performance as a performer on the microphone, his facials, his intonation, his prosody for getting into technical voice stuff, his ad libs, the Joker stuff in there. Not so many, yeah, on this album as in previous work, but it just feels like luxury to listen to this, the highest caliber of what is possible in this kind of sub-genre of hip hop, one that I do love. And it's just something about this album, man. It's almost like an amalgamation, a compilation of the sounds that made me fall in love with this genre in the first place. You know, I fell in love with rap when I first heard Jay-Z's The Blueprint and that Kanye West production. And then, of course, Kanye's own albums. I fell in love with so many of these sounds from hearing the Neptunes and N.E.R.D.'s music and then Pharrell working with the likes of Jay-Z, with Snoop, with Britney fucking Spears. And an amalgamation of all these sounds brought into a modern context with one of the finest rappers to ever grab a microphone and also a rapper that was another reason I fell in love with this genre, a rapper from Clips in Pusha T. It's just everything I could have wanted, a more extended, drawn out version of Daytona without a track quite as good as the games we play because that might actually be one of my favorite songs of all time. But still, the rap album of the year, Pusha T is almost dry as JD certified. So number one then, if you've been following me all year, you probably knew this was going to be the case. It is uh, Britain's Black Country New Road with the album Antrim up there. Just an absolute masterpiece from front to back. One of the most rewarding, mind-blowing, staggering first reactions that I ever had. I'm thankful that the full uncut version of that reaction is up on, well, it's up on um, JD Rocks from a band I'd never heard of to suddenly people in my comments saying, John, you really need to check this band out. And I'm like, 99% of the requests that I get, and I get a lot, are for rap. Sometimes offshoots of rap, whether it's cloud rap or, you know, something along those lines, but vast majority, very, very, very rarely 
is it for rock music? Now, you wouldn't necessarily call this rock, perhaps post-rock, perhaps prog. There's also, you know, labeling it doesn't necessarily make sense. But the fact that I was getting this many requests for this album was very strange. And then I saw Fantano, did a review and gave it a very high score, which again doesn't necessarily mean it's going to correlate with my taste. But I thought, you know what, I'll sit there and you can see this on a reaction. I'll sit there one evening in this room, no green screen, I'll crack open a drink and I'll just listen to it. And what a moment that was. Track after track, moment after moment, instrument after instrument of this huge group ensemble cast putting together music so mind-blowing, so intricate, so emotionally heavy, yet light and humorous at the same time, witty and whimsical and dark and introspective, challenging and shocking, with unbelievable longevity as well, nearly a year on from when it was put out. I listened to a lot of it again today, just before this is a refresher, and hits even harder. Such a shame that lead singer Isaac Wood um, chose to leave the band uh, literally pretty much the day that this album came out. But also, you know, a good thing that somebody chose to to look after their mental well-being and mental health um, in spite of like perhaps future success because, you know, what's future success if you're not here to enjoy it? The band continues. Um, from what I understand, the newer music that they're putting out is still fantastic. But, you know, we'll have this moment in time here in Anstrom up there and their previous record as well. But this one, they sound like a band that have been making music for decades. And yet they put this out, what, 18 months after a previous project, which is almost as incredible, a rare thing a rare find, a rare moment you just don't get very often in music. Basketball shoes, the bread song, Concord, the place where I inserted the blade, which is got to be the best song of the year. An absolute masterpiece and one that I think that anybody that has an appreciation, understanding or, or just love of music will get something out of. And the brilliant thing about it is it, 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 sound, it all sounds a bit twee at first, and I'm not really, it's not really my cup, but no, stunning, stunning music. What the Arcade Fire perhaps should have gone on to be, and they put an album out this year that wasn't so good. And from up there, you can see the full reaction on the channel, and that speaks more of this album than I can do right here. The JD, John Denton, JD the Prophet, best album of 2022. Get yours down in the comments, subscribe for the journey. Have a great holiday period. And I will see you all very soon.